So thanks. I appreciate everyone getting up early in the morning to listen to uh, cancer and GU cancer uh, specifically. So um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is, the, is renal cancer. Here are some of my disclosures. You can read through them. Um, so I think that the first thing that I've emphasized and it's going to become uh, ever more important is that kidney cancer, like many of our other cancers, is becoming increasingly um, subdivided into different histologic and molecular subtypes. Uh, clear cell cancer, uh, right now we're uh, subdividing those by Furman grading and grading, but there's uh, increasing molecular definitions that that sub subgroup may be divided further. Papillary renal cancers, and there is uh, at least two subtypes, but probably more. Um, every time I listen to our pathologists, they tell me about another subtype. Chromophobe cancer, which is genetically related to uh, the benign oncocytomas. Collecting duct cancers, which are genetically related to urothelial and uh, medullary cancers that we see in sickle cell patients may be a subtype of this uh, tumor. And then the TFE3 th uh, translocation tumors, which is a similar translocation that one sees in a rare pediatric malignancy, um, but is also a subtype. And I think that although we have a tendency to treat uh, patients um, all the same, and uh, the I think we do have to recognize that over time we're going to think, have to think about these a little bit differently. So what do we know about this disease? I think it's uh, useful to summarize some of our um, uh, current state of knowledge. First is that the natural history is highly variable. Um, and therefore, metastatic site ablative therapy has a role, and primary tumor uh, resection continues to have a role, I think, in patients with low volume metastatic disease. Immunotherapy has activity. We've known this ever since the days of high-dose IL-2, and we're learning more about this, as uh, David mentioned, with immune checkpoint inhibitors. VEGF pathway inhibitors slow disease progression in the majority of renal cell cancer patients, and they likely improve survival. And the mTOR inhibitors have some modest anti-tumor activity as well. So this is our prognostic model really showing how variable natural history may be. And the um, solid lines are from historical data sets and based on some you know, basically simple uh, clinical parameters, there's a group of patients with poor prognosis where the vast majority are, are dead within two years, but then there are patients with good prognosis uh, where we have about 10 percent of patients who are alive at 10 years, and this is without any effective therapy. And I think we have to recognize that as we begin to use our therapies, therapies that can have real toxicities to patients, that there's a group of patients who can do long, well for long periods of time without even any uh, treatment. The other part here is that this uh, model, which was based on historical data, was then applied to um, population-based uh, uh, data in the uh, modern uh, TKI VEGF pathway inhibitor era, and that's the dotted lines, and in some ways this is some of the best data that um, our current therapies have an impact on actual survival um, because many of these therapies were developed over the, over the short time frame uh, and the survival benefits in the randomized phase three trials were either um, non-existent or minimal, always raising the question whether this was due to crossover or whether the drugs had a minimal effect. This population-based data uh, suggests that these drugs are having a real effect on survival. So one of my first take-home points is that for, given this natural history, is that for asymptomatic metastatic patients, with a minimal burden of disease, I would consider either ablative therapy to render the patient uh, disease-free, if that is possible, with either surgery or stereotactic radiosurgery, or active surveillance. It's a little bit of a longer conversation in the clinic, but at the end of the day, it's probably the right thing to do. So here's historical data with high-dose IL-2. Um, here is um, lower doses of subcutaneous IL-2 interferon, high-dose IL-2, modestly si uh, sized uh, randomized trial. And I think that this trial uh, demonstrates um, what is perhaps the most um, important observation is that there's a small group of patients who have three-year complete response rates. It's only about 5 to 10 percent of patients, but um, that is really sort of the major benefit from this particular therapy. I think that it's, all, it's also become clear that patients who do not have a conventional or clear cell renal cancer have a minimal benefit. Um, there have been some suggestions that high-dose IL-2 post 
VEGFR TKI therapy has higher toxicity and lower efficacy, but that's retrospective, and I would call that data somewhat soft. We've already seen some of this data. Dave mentioned the nivolumab in renal cancer, uh, really uh, demonstrating that um, there is a robust response rate in the phase three trial versus everolimus has completed accrual, and we will hopefully see that uh, data relatively soon. This was um, conducted in patients who have had a pr prior um, VEGFR TKI therapy. Um, and here's the other um, uh, agent, once again, uh, reasonable um, high um, response rates, at least um, as a single agent, um, but uh, in addition to the response rate, um, some uh, impressive uh, longer stable disease, whether that translates into um, actual improved survival <laughs> is the subject of an uh, ongoing phase three trial. The combination of nivolumab and mifilumumab um, has received a lot of press. Here's are some of these um, you know, dendrograms of, of patients, and, and the interesting thing here is that the majority of patients do respond, uh, but toxicity can be significant, and um, BMS has elected to take this into a phase three trial uh, as well. So I think that um, in terms of immunotherapy as of today, I think we should still consider high-dose IL-2 uh, as first-line therapy in patients with clear cell, good performance status, and good cardiopulmonary reserve. I think that these, uh, this treatment should be performed at a center with experience. I think that um, like uh, major surgeries such as uh, radical cystectomy or Whipple procedures, um, patient outcome is highly dependent on be having this done in a center that has a team of individuals and especially nursing care that are familiar with these, uh, with these treatments. And if that doesn't exist, then the death rate is gonna equal that uh, long-term complete response rate. And I think that that's probably not in the patient's best interest. I think that the investigational immunotherapy approaches are, are, are reasonable and where these things are gonna fall out um, in terms of uh, eventual first, second line therapy. I think uh, that uh, we'll get a little bit more information over the next year or two as these phase three trials are completed. In regards to VEGF tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors, um, I, I use this slide which I've had in my um, packet here now for a number of years, uh, basically to point out that this concept of targeted therapy is um, a little bit of intellectual hubris. Um, you know, just to think that this is a kinome map of all the different kinases inhibited by these uh, two drugs, and to call uh, sunitinib a targeted therapy, and to call 5-FU, which happens to target, target thimidylate synthase, some kind of toxic chemotherapy, I think is um, blatantly false. I think both of these uh, drugs um, <clears throat> happen to target uh, activities that uh, are important for oncogenesis. They work, and they all have toxicities. And so in some ways, we should go back to what's important to the patient, which is what is, you know, what are the good effects and what are the toxicities, and quit trying to talk about you know, targeted therapy versus non-targeted therapy or uh, something that's magical because it goes by mouth as opposed by vein. So <clears throat> this is uh, the frontline uh, data with sunitinib versus uh, interferon, um, a modest uh, improvement in survival. Um, whether this uh, p-value here is uh, 0.051 or 0.049 depends on whether um, you, depends on who and when one does the analysis. I, I think whether to call that statistically significant or insignificant based on the magical 0.05 is a little bit of praying at the altar um, and not um, true data. I think that in many ways uh, there is a modest improvement in survival and the population data that I showed you earlier suggests that the lack of a more robust survival advantage in the phase three trial may very well be due to crossover in this particular um, trial here. There has been a combination, there have been comparative trials of sunitinib versus pazopinib in the first line setting. This is progression free survival data, very little difference between these two agents. And there, but there is some data that pazopinib is a somewhat better tolerated by patients and that the quality of life um, is better with pazopinib. <clears throat> Um, these, this is a slide that shows all of the comparative studies of the various VEGF um, pathway inhibitors, the context in which they were performed, and the overall outcome. 
Uh, you can read through this, and, but I'll give you my conclusion here in a couple of slides um, in terms of you know, what that means. But here is the data, and you can take a look at both you know, a, either how good or how bad these at various comparisons might be. I think we do need to pay a little bit of attention to the um, toxicities. Um, these drugs all have uh, uh, reversible, all have hypertension associated. If one does not pay attention or treat that hypertension appropriately, bad things happen to patients. Reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy, MIs, CVAs, one can see CHF. I think we have to pay attention to these toxicities and uh, giving a pill, asking the patient to come back two months later is not a way that one can manage these treatments. All of the drugs cause hand, foot, mucositis, and diarrhea. The different drugs have different incidences. Um, Serafinib has a somewhat higher incidence of some of these um, toxicities as opposed to perhaps the others. All the drugs cause fatigue um, and lack of taste. Some of that fatigue is due to hypothyroidism, but not all of it. Um, and this lack of taste is a real issue for patients. And this is what patients will complain about. And this may actually contribute to sometimes some of the weight loss that we see. All the drugs cause a, a certain degree of liver toxicity. And in this context, the incidence of liver toxicity is greatest with bazopinib. Um, one, uh, these liver toxicities are reversible. But once again, if you're not paying attention and not watching it, bad things happen to patients. So um, my take on all the data is that there's no definitive data as to which VEGF pathway inhibitor to use first. I think the best evidence based on quality of life considerations suggests pazopinib, but then one has to monitor and be uh, considerate of the liver toxicity issues. I didn't show the data, but dose intensity probably matters. Um, VEGF pathway inhibitors can be used sequentially. I don't know if there's any advantage with intermittent therapy as opposed to just sequential therapy. Uh, and every drug company has at least one VEGFR inhibitor. This is the drug company Lemming Principle. Um, and there are pharmacologic but minimal clinical differences between these various agents. Um, speaking of um, Lemming Principle, these are the three available mTOR inhibitors that are out. Um, Everolimus, Sirolimus, and Temsirolimus. Um, Sirolimus is, is essentially generic. All of the drugs here, um, the active pharmacophore is the cyclic peptide ring, not to uh, memorize the structure, but I've circled what's different between all the three of these drugs. Um, the difference between serolimus and temsirolimus is this is an alcohol uh, and this is an ether linkage. When you infuse temsirolimus, um, uh, serum uh, esterases immediately cleave it to serolimus. The only reason the drug company developed temsirolimus rather than serolimus as an oncology drug was that this was going off patent and they needed something that was on patent. Um, whether there's any real differences here I think remains to be debated. Everolimus happens to be oral. This is an ether linkage uh, that is not broken down in, in the body, uh, is not metabolized, uh, but whether that leads to any differences in terms of efficacy, aside from the different schedules of administration, I think remains an open question. <clears throat> this is the best data with, uh, with, ever, with um, the various mTOR inhibitors. This was a trial of temsorolimus versus interferon versus the combination. If you give the combination, um, it's essentially too toxic, and patients don't get the drug, and surprisingly, they, don't, they do just as well as the interferon. Temsorolimus, actually, those patients survive better and survive longer. The effect is modest and of importance. This trial was done in, quote, poor prognosis patients, um, but this is the data that allowed temsorolimus to be um, approved by the FDA. In the second-line setting, there is this data versus um, placebo in patients who'd received the prior VEGFR TKI looks uh, fairly impressive. I think that um, what one has to be careful about is that this x-axis is months. So patients who have placebo at two months when you do your first CT scan, most of the half the patients have progressed. If they happen to be on Everolimus, um, about half the patients go to the next CT scan before they uh, progress. So you get one extra CT scan on average. Not so great. 
What might be perhaps more interesting is some of the data out here. There's a handful of patients who on these drugs actually do uh, reasonably well for longer periods of time. And I think that there's emerging data that um, alterations in the mTOR pathway, including things such as TSC mutations, may predict for these patients. And I think uh, we need to watch uh, this space a little bit because that may be a way to select this particular therapy. Here's the survival data, not a lot of difference. There have been some comparative data between um, uh, a VEGF inhibitor and a um, mTOR inhibitor. This was a small randomized trial where patients were randomized to one of the two and then crossed over. Um, and the primary endpoint was the first-line progression-free survival. Perhaps not so surprising, maybe a little bit hard to see, but the patients who got um, uh, sunitinib here had um, improved progression-free survival, at least in the uh, first progression, in the first, uh, after the first randomization. It was, however, anticipated that because there was a crossover that there would not be any lot of difference in survival, but there was a difference in survival. In fact, the patients on sunitinib had an improved survival over those who were on everolimus, uh, suggesting that starting with a VEGFR TKI has an advantage over starting with uh, everolimus, at least in this group of patients who are more intermediate and good prognosis patients. <clears throat> Toxicity of these agents mainly metabolic. One has to once again pay attention to uh, the, your internal medicine training, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, mild increase in creatinine. The <laughs> hyperlipidemia, especially hypertriglyceridemia, can be quite significant and occasionally requires treatment. You can get some diarrhea, mucositis, and rash, but those tend to be not as bothersome. Um, fatigue, edema, rare pneumonitis, I think, is something that one needs to pay attention to. These drugs can cause an um, allergic pneumonitis that is steroid responsive, but one has to be aware of it uh, and, um, and manage appropriately. If, uh, if it's asymptomatic, we can often treat through it, but if it becomes symptomatic, we often hold the drug and we may even need to give steroids. Um, but one has to sort of pay attention and make sure that this isn't also due to an a, atypical infection, which also occurs with these particular drugs. <clears throat> Here are the comparisons that have been made between various, uh, these various drugs, and I think from my interpretation of the data, it's not clear where and when mTOR inhibitors should be used with some of the best data as first-line therapy in poor prognosis patients. I think I need to mention, after ASCO-GU, I need to mention adjuvant therapy. Um, there are a number of large randomized placebo-controlled phase three trials of using VEGFR um, TKIs or everolimus in the adjuvant setting in patients with high-risk disease following nephrectomy. Um, this uh, was the ECOG study of serafinib versus sunitinib versus placebo. A pazopinib versus placebo trial has been uh, completed, and an everolimus versus placebo trial is in progress. This is the data as presented uh, a few weeks ago at ASCO-GU in disease-free survival. Be, uh, in that uh, ECOG study, um, one does not need to be a Cracker Jack statistician to understand that these are completely and totally overlapping with no difference between the, di between the various uh, treatments. And so conclusions in terms of treatment algorithm for kidney cancer, I think that VEGF pathway-directed agents are active in clear cell renal cancer. All these various combinations improve progression-free survival. I think that at least uh, for um, clinical trial purposes, pazopinib is a first-line reference standard these days. Um, sequential VEGF pathway-directed therapy um, probably improves survival with the best data coming from population-based studies. The mTOR, um, the mTOR inhibitors are active in renal cancer. Um, I talked about temsorolimus and poor prognosis for, uh, and the everolimus in the second line setting, but I think the role of these agents is in often decreasing unless we can identify a molecular phenotype that, uh, to which the patient can respond. Immunotherapy is active. High-dose IL-2 leads to co long-term complete responses in about 5% of pathway patients. Um, these PD-1 pathway inhibitors are almost certainly going to play a role in the future, and we're awaiting the phase three studies to define that a little bit better. So I'll stop there and thank everyone for their attention. <clears throat>